Dear friends, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, accomplish the purpose for which you send your word right now. Cheer our hearts and direct us. Let us know with specificity what to do with the word you have told us so that we can be a light in our world. Amen. Sometimes there is intense pressure to conform to the desires of others. Let me talk to parents for just a little bit. If you're a parent with young children, you know what it's like to try to fulfill the desires of your kids. And you know, and I, you and I know how great it is when we can fulfill those desires. Well, I had a, a brief uh, shot on Pinterest to see how some parents were fulfilling the desires of their kids and conforming to them. I thought I'd share with you some moments of these parents just trying to please their kids. So, so here's uh, here's one uh, princess family, and uh, this dude wants to conform. He wants to fit in with the frozen mentality too, right? Conform the pressure to conform. Uh, then we got this guy, you know, baby screaming, I'm screaming, right? Um, you have this man, rocking the barrette. He's got girls, I can relate. And then this last one just strikes me strange. Um, let's see what you think about it. You got a Darth Vader princess. So apparently the girl really wanted to be a Darth Vader princess, and, uh, and so that's what ensues. And, and you guys can relate too, right? You know what it's like to be driving, and you didn't really want to stop for ice cream, but everyone's belly aching for ice cream, and so, well, you stop for ice cream right? You know, it's one, your, your child wanted a pet, right? And so you go to the pet store, and, and over time, now you have 10, right? And, and that's just what we do for our kids, because we want to fulfill those desires in general. But though that is what we feel, let me ask, is it always good to conform to those desires? Should there be a dad wearing an honor or Elsa princess dress, right? Should I be rocking a barrette? I have two girls. Should I go for, like, pigtails? And then Star Wars fans, come on. Should there really be a Princess Darth Vader? No. No, I disagree. Some things you just don't touch. New Star Wars movie is coming out soon. All right. Um, But you know what it is. And and, and now I want to talk, especially if you are a Christian, okay? And and welcome again if you're not. but, But if you are a Christian, you need to know... That just as parents feel the pressure to conform, you will feel the pressure to conform to the world around you. You will. And while some things are okay, like it's okay if we all like Chipotle. That's all right, okay? Uh, Go eat Chipotle for lunch. But it's not okay in certain other areas. It's not okay. What's going on in in, in the world today is not okay just to blend in and, and to conform to the desires of what's going on right now. And today, um, we kind of get an understanding of what to do. Because today is Confirmation Sunday. And instead of conforming, we have six people who are sticking out here on stage and confessing their faith in Jesus. I'm not sure how much that's going on in high schools and grade schools across America, but I think it's awesome that young people stand up and say, I believe in God and I commit to following him. You know, in fact, one of our essayists uh, brought up the movie God's Not Dead. Has anyone seen uh, the movie God's Not Dead? Okay. One of the best Christian movies I've seen. I really re- recommend it. Um, and and there, the, the premise is that there is a classroom where the professor is trying to tell everyone God is dead. And as long as you sign up to that, you know, then we'll be okay in this class. One student, though, says God's not dead. And he goes on uh, weeks of, of lessons trying to prove how he is alive. That's a picture of what our confirmands are doing in a world that asks us to conform, to again say, how am I going to stick out and shine a light and be a light? But to do that, I need you to ask a question. I need you to do some internalization. Ask this question about yourself. In what unhealthy ways is the world right now asking you to conform? In what unhealthy ways is the world asking you to conform? Maybe it's how we spend certain things. Maybe it's a way of spending money that just you know is not God-pleasing. Maybe it's the way we spend our bodies in dating or with sex that you know is not God-pleasing. Maybe it's the way we spend our time and we're just conforming to the priorities that were handed down to the age that we live in instead of God-like priorities. In what ways is your world asking you to conform And the answer of what to do is also found in the Bible for us. 
Hear what uh, Jesus uh, said through the words of Paul. He said this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we want to talk today about how to be transformed in the renewing of our mind. How to stick out. And then we see there is one who we should live for. There is one who has the right to conform us. Who is that one that has the right to conform us, dear friends? It's our God. And seeking His will and His ways above all. And that is what we want to talk about. You know, the sermon today really reminds me of one of my favorite children's songs. It's called This Little Light of Mine. And I'm going to give you a chance to participate in this little light of mine. And my favorite part, my favorite part was uh, verse 2. And, uh, and I'm going to prompt you for your part. So are you ready? Are you ready with me here? Okay. Um, it went like this. Hide it under a bushel. No. Let's try it again. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. One last time. Hide it under a bushel. No. Awesome. I'm going to let it shine. And that is what we're talking about. We're going to say no from like our belly when the world tries to conform and, and quench that light and shut it out. We're going to say no in the face of that, and that's what we want to talk about and do this morning. Well, our leader in that task is a man named Daniel. Uh, let, let's see what's happening in Daniel. Daniel was under a lot of evil influences from the world. Now, his evil influences were not the Kardashians. Kim and Kanye were not hijacking his brainwaves. But rather, it was the Babylonians. You see, uh, they had conquered where he was living, and they were trying to inundate him with the Babylonian culture, which meant changing his God, which meant changing the way that he thought. Yet he stood firm. He stoked the fire of his faith, and he stuck out in the midst of a place that wanted to conform him. Let's read from his story now. Would you follow along with me in Daniel chapter 1? We'll read the whole section, and this will be the basis of of our sermon for today. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he say you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Well, Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, the good news is, let me pause, this isn't an advocation for, you know, vegetarian lifestyle. Isn't that great? Isn't that a wonderful thing? We, we don't have to just go away and eat vegetables, and yet there's a point we'll talk about here. Um, he goes on. Then compare our appearance with the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. This is the Word of God. Not the vegetarian lifestyle, but Daniel is showing us how not to conform. May God bless this discussion. I don't know if you noticed, but little boys and little girls grow up markedly different. From my observation, it seems that God has made little boys very physical. You know what I'm talking about? Little boys are those who wrestle with their dads. Little boys can be tornadoes in the house that you just cleaned. You know, and, 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 and it plays out in how they fight, right? Um, if there is a conflict, the way that boys fight is physical. Let's say someone stole their Twinkie. Let's say they're not being able to play Minecraft or any other video game. That little boy will probably charge the other boy, pin him to the ground, and say, you're going to let me play Minecraft. You know what I'm talking about. Girls, and I have two, are very different. Girls seem to be very verbal. You know what I'm talking about? 
Like, I can have a conversation with Bella at age two just because she, she knew how to do that, right? Words are the weapon of choice for girls, and that dictates the way they fight. So this is what happens. Let's say they're not getting what they want. They can't play Minecraft. It's the same issue, but they go about it differently. And they might go just to another girl and say, you know what, that girl over there, and, and internally they think they didn't let me play Minecraft, but they'll, they'll do it this way. They'll say, their outfit looks bad. Their hair is awful today, don't you think? And they're not even like bringing up the, the issue, right? But when, when things go wrong, girls handle it with words more than with actions and physicality. I'm not sure where you are in that spectrum, but I do know at one time or another, we're all going to have to deal with name-calling and hard words. I want to bring up a story with my, my daughter and my wife. Uh, my daughter gave me permission to share, on face, uh, to share this, uh, what she posted on Facebook. Um, recently, uh, my, my daughter Bella's in soccer, and she was called, get this, the worst player ever. And then my, my wife, she was called a loser mom. Now, I don't mean to be throwing a pity party at all because how many of you have ever been called a name? Who's been called a name? Right. This is going to happen. For me, it was Doughboy and Chubby. <laughs> Thank you. But what do we do with that? How do we get past the words that can hurt, that are more than sticks and stones? Daniel shows us. Let's look back at, at Daniel's story. Daniel is being called some names that are trying to conform him to something he doesn't want to conform to. Let's look at verse 7. Let's get into it. Verse 7 said, The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Now go with me here, but you need to understand what these names mean to understand what's going on. When you start with Daniel... Daniel meant that God, the one true God, is my judge. When he goes to Babylon, they're trying to brainwash him to the gods of Babylon. One of them was Bel, which was the equivalent of Zeus or Jupiter or the, the, the leader god, and it was changed to Bel's prince. To another one, Hananiah meant the Lord, the one true God, is gracious. When it was changed to Shadrach, that was a reference to the sun god, which meant illumined by the sun god. See what's going on here? Goes on. Mishael meant who is as God, the one true God. It was changed to Meshach, who is like Venus, the goddess of love. Final one, Azariah, the Lord is my help, is changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nego. Nego is the god of wisdom and literature. It's very intentional to try to get the way they think conform to their likeness, to change their thought process and who they were at their core. But if you see, did Daniel fight the name change? He didn't. And this is what was working in Daniel that I hope can be at work in you. That people can call me names, but it doesn't change my identity. Daniel knew who he was. Daniel knew that the Lord was still his judge and the Lord was still God because he didn't believe in Bel. You can know this day, no matter what names you're calling yourself, whether it's helpless, worthless, or unlovable. Maybe it's names like Daniel you bear for, for, for trying to follow Jesus. Names like weird, preachy, judgy, outspoken, awkward. Daniel would convince you and say, those names they're calling you or you've called yourself does not change your true identity. Back to why my wife uh, posted on Facebook. That was the reason that she posted what she did. Not, not for the pity party, but to get to this point. Here's my first quote from Catherine Bloomer. She says, when those names happen, you're doing it or others are doing it, what we need to do is go to the opinion of the only one who matters, which is God. God who doesn't see us as worthless, but sent his son to save us. God who doesn't think we're losers, but calls us his dearly loved child. That's our identity, isn't it? And here's what's great. If you're listening online for the first time, if you don't consider yourself a Christian, I want you to know this day, you have the right to be called a child of God. And let me explain how it works. This past week, I played basketball. And I was awful. I literally shot one for 20. 
And I was practicing at LA Fitness for a long time to try, because this was my game. Like I was playing with my brother and I was going to go great and I just messed up completely. I wanted to hide because it was that bad. But we had one guy on our team who was really good. He had a shot down, he was in the zone, and because of that one guy, we won the game. And it wasn't me. I didn't have anything to contribute. I was a deficit. But because of that one guy, I'm a winner. It's great. It's wonderful. That's the essence of the gospel, my friends. If you're new to Christ, that's how it works. You see, it's not based on your performance. I know what we all know, that we're not perfect. We all have had some major, major hang-ups, some major blunders. We didn't make the shot, but Jesus comes in. And based on his performance and his perfect life and his death on the cross, he says, you are a child of God because of me, not you. And that's why you can wear that identity today, no matter your history, no matter your background, no matter if this is the first time you're hearing it, you are a child of God through Jesus. That's awesome. And that's what Daniel knew. But there's more. There's more to consider. As we move on, um, I want to talk about something that made the news this past week, and it's kind of heartbreaking. It has to do uh, with this family, 19 kids and counting. And it has to do with Josh Duggar, and I'm not even going to say what he did. You can read that online. But what I do want to talk about is how they're handling what he did. He did something uh, that was a sin, um, and uh, now everyone's hearing about it. And, and people are like, well, can we watch the show anymore? What they're doing, though, is being very decisive. When, when the story came up, they, they didn't say, no, it didn't happen, or try to push it under the rug. They said, yep, that happened, and we ran to Jesus, and we know Josh is forgiven. They owned it. And it seems they're very decisive in the face of public opinion. Where others like Lance Armstrong or Deflate Gate or take your pick, right? Um, try to get away from that and, and aren't sure about what they're going to say and, and all that kind of thing. They know what they're saying to the press. And their story isn't changing. And that's what's going to happen. They took decisive action even in the midst of this. Now, now let me go on a tangent. The reason I bring this up is because this identifies again what grace is. Okay? For Christians, you know what grace is, right? Grace is the lavish love of God that is undeserved. It's completely undeserved. That's what grace is. God didn't need to love us because we were a mean Mr. Grumpy Pants someday. He didn't need to love us because we're the ones who tell little white lies and steal candy bars. He needs to love us because we screwed up big time. And grace, by definition, again, is the love of God, the lavish love for the undeserved. I love that when it comes to Jesus, he says to murderers, he says to adulterers, he says to the chief sinners of our society, to you and to me, you know what, I saw it, but you are forgiven. Because my love goes that long. Because I'm that good. I didn't just die for mean old Mr. Grumpy Pants. I died for the chief of sinners like Josh Duggar, like Pastor Bloomer, and like you. That's grace. That was my tangent. But they decided, back, back to my main thought, they decided on what they were going to do and decided how they were going to handle it beforehand. Now as I draw to Daniel, do you know he's decided his course of action? Let's get into verse uh, eight and see what he has decided beforehand what to do. Verse 8, it said, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Now, now let me explain this because you're like, well, what is really going on here? The food and wine was most likely dedicated to the gods of Babylon. So if he would partake of that food and wine, he was basically committing idolatry. Their celebration was similar to our celebration of the Lord's Supper. You know, so to participate was basically bowing down to these gods. Not only that, but in the Old Covenant law, which isn't ours today, but in the Old Covenant law, if you read the book of Leviticus, there were certain foods that were clean and unclean. He would have been breaking the covenant law he was under to eat these foods. And so he had decided, he had resolved that he wasn't going to do that. It wouldn't happen. 
Dear friends, as you stoke the fire of your faith, I'm hoping that God work into you to resolve a few things. To decide right now what you're going to do to stoke that fire. Let me talk about a few things to resolve on. The first one, this is for confirmands and for everyone. I would love for you to resolve to read your Bible. I would love for you to resolve to read your Bible. I won't ask for a raise of hands for a personal Bible study, but I hope and pray it is going on. And as I was at a conference this past week, um, it was basically a pastor's small group. And, uh, and we have the, the lead coach who used to be on the SWAT team. And the dude is ripped. Like, he puts the fear of God in you, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, his biceps are as big as my legs. They're just crazy. And, and, and what he said was so, he, he was going tough on us. Uh, some people call it you know, calling into the carpet or taking into the woodshed. He was going tough. And uh, he, he, he asked the question, if you guys are not um, having personal Bible study, and these are all pastors, he said, if you pastors are not having personal Bible study, you know what he told us to do? He said, quit the ministry then. Get out. If you as pastor don't have time to have a personal Bible study, you should not be leading others. That's how seriously he took it. Because he loved us. Can I love you by being serious? You've got to be in your Bibles. You've got to do it personally and you've got to be here. Because if you don't, that light could turn out. It could turn off completely forever and you would be lost if you do not resolve to get in the Word. Resolve that right now. And if you need a Bible, we would love to give you one for free. Next thing to resolve. Resolve to surround yourself with Christians. We are in a spiritual battle and there is a real devil who would love nothing more than to pick us off. I was doing some research and I heard about lions, that when it comes to lions and how they attack their prey, uh, the devil is a lion, right? That usually, they don't attack a herd, they look for the strays. And they pick off the easy ones. The ones that don't have uh, the others to protect them. And that's how he operates. If you are a stray right now, Christian, if you think you can do life on your own without the group or help of others, I would say you're, you're underestimating the lion's strength. To our confirmands, I want to make your life really easy. I want to make your dating and friend life really easy. I would advocate that you would date Christians and marry Christians. I would date that your friends are Christians and that your inner circle are Christians. I'm going to broaden that out for everyone here. I would advocate that the voices you listen to most in your life would be Christian voices that are following the ways that you want to listen to and the ways that you want to go because otherwise you're going to have to stick out as they tell you to conform and that's going to be hard. Now, it's not sinful to be around non-Christians. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about your inner circle. The person you decide to marry someday, I hope knows Jesus. Because then they can love you like Jesus. And they can follow Jesus' ways. And they won't make you feel like you have to stick out to follow. Surround yourself with Christian influences. At Amazing Love, the way that works is our group life. In the fall, we will continue to advocate group life. And I want you to decide today that you're going to be part of our group life. That you're going to walk beside other Christians and you're going to allow them to pray for you and you're going to allow them in your life and you're going to allow them to encourage you as you go. Real change is possible, but it happens as we walk with others and we hear their prayers and encouragement. Final thing to resolve. The pre-decision of avoiding sin. For our confirmands and teens, this is about your party and dating life. When it comes to a date, decide beforehand what you're going to do and what activities are allowed. So that when it's at the end of the night and you're alone in the car, you already know. You already know. When it comes to a party, you know what's going to happen. And, and if there are things that you don't want to part of, you've already decided. Christians in the workplace whether it's a new job or your job the next day tomorrow, pre-decide you're going to be a man or a woman of integrity. You're going to follow the ways of God at work. You're going to shine a light in just what you do and how you operate. Pre-decide right now as we use alcohol, as we talk, as we spend money, that we're going to follow God's ways. Because the light bulb could go out. 
And I would hate that to happen to any one of you. Look at what happened when Daniel decided to, to do these things. Verse 9. Verse 9, it says, Now God had caused the chief official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Do you think God is able to bless you as you resolve this day to follow him? So what excuses are left? What are the ways that God is prompting in your heart to stick out and no longer conform? Dear friends, if you've identified that, would you join with me in repentance and say, today is the last day I'm conforming. Today is the last day I'm going to let that happen. And would you rally with me at the cross? Would we come here and see we are completely forgiven of everything for all the times I didn't get it right, for all the times I looked like everyone else in all the worst ways. Jesus says, I knew it and that's why I died. And you and I are forgiven. Claim your forgiveness there. And I was all through. And what would it look like if we all did this? What would our community look like and our family look like and our workplace look like? What's the vision of the future, my friends? I want to talk a little bit about hibachi restaurants. My wife and I celebrated our 10-year anniversary this past week. Two hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to do that, we used a living social coupon and went for hibachi. If you've ever been to hibachi, you might have known that they do something called the volcano onion. You know what I'm talking about? I have a picture of it here. And for a guy who loves fire, this is awesome to me. I mean, he has the trail of fire going and then... And, and, and have you ever been close enough to a fire where you can feel it on your face? And because I'm a hairy dude, I was, I was a little bit nervous that my eyebrows were going to burn off. Now, they didn't. These are my real eyebrows. But you know what I'm saying. You can feel it. And it's like, whoa, you know. And I believe if we would resolve to do this and God would work in us and so bless us, that we could live in such a way that people feel the fire in us. In fact, I would advocate that we do this today. Let's burn some eyebrows off. Let's do it. Let's be so on fire for Jesus, so pumped up about his words, so pumped about his activity that he, they feel the heat and maybe even burn the eyebrows off. Let's do that. When we resolve to be in the word, you know what happens? You can lose games. You can get fired. You, you can got, not get a good report at school or at work, and you can be okay because you know it's not the boss's opinion that matters. It's not your coworker's opinion or the teacher's opinion. It's God's. I may have gotten fired yesterday, but I'm still a child of God. Booyah. Right? Or people might see you and feel the fire by how you've changed. And you're like, wow, I remember you struggling with that or, or being like that. And how did that happen? And you could say, well, I walked with a group of Christians and they prayed for me and they supported me and I was able to change by the help and grace of God. Dear friends, great is our opportunity if we resolve this day to live for Jesus and stay in him. May God give you strength not to conform, but be transformed by his grace. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends our understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, at this time, uh, we will collect our offering and, and uh, we ask that everyone fill out those connection cards as well and place them in the baskets. Uh, you may be seated. Thank you.